Hello, and welcome to today's webcast. I'm PI Process Instrumentation Chief Editor Jesse Osborne. Today's presentation, Emerging Opportunities for Safer Ammonia Sampling, is sponsored by SwageLock. Ammonia is commonly used by chemical plants and refineries in the production of fertilizers, plastics, textiles, petroleum, and more. To avoid severe stress corrosion cracking in storage tanks and product quality concerns, anhydrous ammonia is sampled to verify a water content of 0.2% to 0.5%. There are many challenges with manual ammonia sampling methods, however. The good news, new technology and techniques are revolutionizing the ammonia sampling process. This presentation explains what you need to know to make ammonia sampling as safe and efficient as possible. Before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. But first, a quick note for the audience. If the slides or audio are not responding at any point during today's presentation, please press the F5 key to refresh your webinar console. We welcome your questions during today's event. In order to submit your question to today's presenter, simply type into the Q&A window of your screen and then hit the submit button. We will be answering as many questions as possible during the question and answer session that will follow the presentation. Today's session is being recorded and will be available on the PI Process Instrumentation website within the next week for you to review. And you'll be notified by email when the archive is available. And now I would like to welcome today's presenter, Matt Dixon, who is an application commercialization manager at SwageLock. Matt began his career at SwageLock in 1998 as an engineering co-op student. In 2004, Matt joined the custom solutions team at SwageLock. His past hands-on experience with SwageLock products has enabled him to grow in this role into a leading integration and application expert within the SwageLock organization. Matt has extensive experience in sampling systems, including developing the Grab Sample module and Grab Sample liquid product lines and developing SwageLock's ammonia sampling system. And now, without any further delay, I'll turn things over to Matt to kick off the presentation. All right, great. Thank you, Jesse. Really appreciate uh, you teeing that up for me. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, as Jesse mentioned, we are going to talk uh, today a bit about ammonia. Uh, so we're going to start off talking a little bit about how ammonia is produced. Uh, so what is, uh, you know, what is it exactly? How, how is it made? Uh, what's the importance of it? And then also, you know, how are we actually using that both uh, in our day-to-day -day lives as well as in an industrial scale? Uh, then we'll talk a little bit more about what uh, Jesse mentioned with regards to sampling. So uh, how do we sample ammonia? What are the challenges associated with that? And how does the Swayzok ammonia sampler solve some of those challenges? So let's go ahead and move on. So first of all, what is ammonia? Well, uh, ammonia, you know, as you probably know, it's a, it's a compound of nitrogen and hydrogen. Uh, NH3 is the formula. Uh, three hydrogens, which makes it uh, very relevant in, in our world going forward here, uh, just in that hydrogen seems to be the, the, the fuel of the future. Uh, you know, it is a colorless gas, uh, but it does have a rather distinct odor, which I'm sure we've all smelled at one point or another, whether it's a, uh, a cleaning solution or for those of us who have cats, obviously we've smelled it before. Uh, it is a flammable gas as well. It has a flammability range, you know, you see there about uh, 12 to 12 to 13% of span of flammability range. So pretty similar in span to a lot of hydrocarbons and uh, you know other materials that we consider to be flammable. Uh, Though shift a little bit, whereas something like a methane, you know, might be in the five to 15% range. Similar range, but shifted a little bit into higher concentrations. Now, ammonia, when we're handling it, we really need to be careful with ammonia. Uh, it is quite hazardous uh, to human health in, in any sort of concentration. Um, you know, it is certainly you know, going to be uh, you know, damaging to the respiratory tract if you breathe it in. Uh, it can definitely irritate skin, mouth, eyes, et cetera. Uh, you least, even, you know, if you're handling the liquid, uh, you have to worry about uh, cryogenic burns. Uh, because, you know, one, it's cold to start with, and two, it has an extraordinary um, you know, heat of vaporization. So as, you know, as it vaporizes, when it touches your skin, it really draws out the warmth from your skin and can, uh, and can uh, you know, give you some frostbite. So uh, it's some, something to really take a lot of precautions with when you're handling. And of course, any real extreme exposure can, you know, unfortunately lead to death. So it's something we need to really pay attention to. Now, when we're looking at ammonia, 
it, it's really produced everywhere in the world. And the reason it's produced everywhere is because 70 plus percent, uh, some people might say as much as 80 or 85 percent uh, of ammonia is used in fertilizer production. So used in agriculture. And of course, we have agriculture everywhere. So as a result, we've got ammonia production used everywhere. The, um, you know, you can see that the chart there, we've got, uh, you know, China by far the biggest producer, but it is distributed in quite a lot of places all around the world. So everywhere you go, you're going to find ammonia. The question is, how do you actually produce it? It's actually uh, produced by combining uh, hydrogen with nitrogen using what's called the Haber-Bosch process. Now, the Haber-Bosch process was invented in uh, the early 1900s, one of the uh, one of the, the, the really the, the most important uh, reactions that's ever been developed in human history. So we're going to watch a little short video here uh, from BASF that kind of details what that process actually looks like. One of BASF's first ammonia reactors stands today in Ludwigshafen as an eloquent testimony to the industrial implementation by Karl Bosch in 1913 of the laboratory-scale ammonia synthesis developed by Fritz Haber. The production of this important basic chemical still has its firm place within BASF's chemistry verbund. To combine the two starting materials, nitrogen and hydrogen, to produce ammonia, the bonds in the diatomic nitrogen molecule have to be broken. Under high pressures of more than 150 bar and temperatures above 400 degrees centigrade, nitrogen adsorbs onto an iron-based catalyst and is split up into atoms. Hydrogen can now be adsorbed and ammonia is produced. The catalyst itself remains unchanged. This reaction generates heat and therefore the reacting hot gas in the ammonia reactor is cooled with a supply of cold gas. This is achieved with a sophisticated flow system of synthesis gas based on the heat exchange principle. In this way, the so-called equilibrium reaction can be prevented in which the ammonia tends to decompose again to its constituent elements. The ammonia is collected as a liquid and stored in tanks. The remaining synthesis gas is returned to the reactor and forms more ammonia. An important precondition for ammonia synthesis is the efficient production of pure hydrogen. In several process steps, this precedes the actual ammonia synthesis. In the primary reformer, first the natural gas methane is heated together with steam to about 800 degrees centigrade and is thereby converted into a mixture of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and hydrogen. In the downstream secondary reformer, air is then added and the remaining methane gas is converted at above 1000 degrees centigrade by means of catalysts and nitrogen is added. Since especially carbon monoxide but also carbon dioxide would damage the iron catalyst used in the ammonia synthesis, they have to be separated off. Carbon monoxide is converted into carbon dioxide in a two-stage process using special catalysts. The carbon dioxide can be removed by a chemical scrubbing process. What remains is the pure synthesis gas consisting of three parts of hydrogen and one part of nitrogen, which can now be transferred to the actual ammonia reactor. A good three-quarters of the global output of ammonia goes into fertilizer production, while the remainder is used for technical products. BASF, the chemical company. Yeah, so again, that video shows, you know, gives you a really good overview of, of what that Haber-Bosch process looks like. Uh, on the front end, you, you have that hydrogen production. Uh, and, you know, in this case, you know, they showed a steam methane reforming, uh, which is a, a gray hydrogen. Now you'll you'll hear people talking about gray hydrogen, green, gray ammonia. Uh, you know what would be blue ammonia? A blue ammonia would be where you produce that hydrogen uh, using that steam methane reforming and then capture the carbon. So obviously a, a, a topic du jour, if you will, for climate change right now. So 
trying to capture that carbon and sequester it. And now if you wanted to go green, uh, the alternative to that would be to produce the hydrogen using some sort of an electrolysis process uh, and then using some sort of renewable power to power that electrolysis. Regardless of how you produce the hydrogen, you then go downstream and you, you have the Haber-Bosch process to convert that into ammonia. And as I mentioned previously, it really is regarded as one of the most important scientific discoveries of the last uh, century or so. Uh, you know, it really has enabled the growth of, of human population over the last uh, century. And it's really important for us to be able to keep producing that. And it is of course then used you know, elsewhere in industry as well, beyond fertilizer, uh, you know, you know this this anhydrous or uh, you know, without water ammonia is used in a lot of different places. Another place that it's used is in refrigeration. So here's a, a view of a typical refrigeration process. Let's start in the bottom left. Uh, you would have a low pressure liquid ammonia. And that low pressure liquid ammonia that would go through some some sort of a heat exchanger. And as I mentioned, there is a, you know, ammonia has a really high, uh, you know, heat of vaporization. So as a result, it's able to draw heat out of whatever it is you're trying to cool down, whether it's some sort of a uh, uh, refrigeration unit or whatever. And as a result, the ammonia, ammonia warms up. Then it goes through a compressor, which is the component you see at the top center. The compressor increases the pressure. Of course, it also adds heat as a result. And then it goes through a heat exchanger to cool it all down. And then you have a high pressure liquid that then gets reduced to a low pressure liquid with some sort of a pressure drop or a, a, a valve or something like that down there at the center bottom. And then it just repeats. So um, it's, ammonia is a great refrigerant used uh, in a lot of those different processes. You know, it has a lot of other uses as well that we that we see quite a bit of. Pharmaceuticals, for example, antibiotics and respiratory stimulants, textile manufacturing, other chemical manufacturing, explosives is another one. Uh, ammonium nitrate is a pretty common explosive. Unfortunately, here in the United States, we learned how powerful that explosive actually is in 1995 with the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, that is uh, what was used in that, uh, that, uh, that terrorist attack. Um, so, you know, a lot of different uses for, for ammonia. Um, another one that's, uh, again, coming up and, uh, you know, kind of an up and coming application for ammonia is to use it as a hydrogen carrier. Of course, it is NH3 or, you know, with three hydrogen atoms in there. And it's a much more convenient way of carrying hydrogen than, say, compressing it or uh, carrying a liquid, uh, liquid hydrogen. You know, the reason for that is because the liquid ammonia can be stored at uh, relatively low, sorry, relatively low pressures and keep that ammonia as a liquid. So you get really good energy density. Uh, you get a lot of hydrogen atoms into a really tight space. Compare that to hydrogen where the liquid temperature is much, much less, uh, much lower than the, uh, than the ammonia. So as a result, you know, it takes a lot more energy to get it there, and then you have to worry about keeping it there as well. And even so, I, I mentioned about the flammability range of the ammonia. The, again, the ammonia vapor has that, what, a 10 to 13, or sorry, 12 to 13 percent uh, flammability range. Compare that to hydrogen itself. Uh, which has a flammability range of 4 to 75%. So a 70% span of flammability for hydrogen. So ammonia has a lot of advantages in terms of transport and energy density and then the safety of transport as well. So there's a lot of things uh, going on there. So as we move into the hydrogen economy, you're going to see this uh, coming where we're going to make hydrogen in one place in the form of ammonia, transport it to wherever that energy is needed, and then it'll be either used directly or converted back to hydrogen and the, and used as hydrogen in that in that location so very common um, or will be very common we expect in the in the coming times now when we're producing the ammonia we do need to make sure that when we say we're producing anhydrous ammonia, it can't be 100% anhydrous. We actually do need to have some amount of water in there. We need to have at least 0.2% in order to avoid stress corrosion cracking in the piping, uh, the stainless steel vessels and pipes through which it's flowing. Uh, you know, we also might need to do some testing for oils or residual or heavy metals, perhaps, that might be in the, uh, in the ammonia as well. 
Now, there are some different tests to be able to do this. Uh, here in North America, uh, one of the very common tests for testing the moisture is a CGA method, uh, CGA G2.2. Uh, there are other similar standards around the world. Now, when we're sampling this, one of the big challenges is that the liquid ammonia is typically sampled right at its boiling point, which is minus 28 Fahrenheit or minus 33 C. Now, if you're familiar with sampling operations, you know that that can be really, really challenging to, to sample something right at its boiling point. Because when you change phases, when your sample changes phases, uh, you can really mess up your sampling, it's no longer representative, et cetera. So one of the big challenges is to avoid the phase change and it's really challenging because when we're right at the boiling point, it, it really does want to change phases at all the times. You can see the line here on our phase diagram. Uh, let's suppose that we were sampling something right at its boiling point at atmospheric pressure. So again, minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 33 C. Now, if we sample it, of course, at that low temperature in ambient temperatures, it's gonna wanna warm up and when we, if we sampled it at ambient temperatures at some elevated pressure, it's gonna to want to lose pressure. And if we let that happen, then it can flash from a liquid to a gas. So if we let that low temperature sample warm up to ambient temperature, now we've changed from a liquid to a gas and we've lost our, the representativeness of our sample. Likewise, if we let that higher pressure sample we let that loot, you know, we let the pressure off of that, again, it's going to want to flash from a liquid to a gas, and we will have lost the representativeness of that sample. So that's one of the biggest challenges when we're looking at sampling ammonia. Now, again, we do have the CGA method that attempts to, to, to account for some of that, uh, but there are some challenges. But first of all, let's go through what that CGA method actually looks like. So first of all, we collect a sample 100 milliliter sample in what's called a residue tube. And that's a piece of glassware that you see there on the right. And you have a little stem there at the bottom with graduations from zero to one milliliter. And then you have a single graduation most of the way up the cylinder there for 100 milliliters. So you fill it up to the 100 milliliter line. You then slowly evaporate the sample and continue heating it to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. You then hold it there for plus for 10 minutes. And then what you're gonna be left with is just a little bit of water. So whatever water happened to be in that, uh, that, in that sample that you took, that's gonna collect down there in the bottom in the stem. You can read that directly on that scale. And because you started with a 100 milliliter sample, it's really easy to do a calculation to figure out how much water you started with. Now, then you can take that that little bit of water and subsequently test it for uh, oil content or other, you know, potentially run other tests. Uh, but really, we're talking about the the, the liquid testing right now, or rather the uh, the moisture testing right now. Now, as I mentioned, there are definitely some challenges with this. Now, one of the big challenges is that you're taking this ammonia that's cold. You know, you're typically sampling it, again, right at its boiling point at atmospheric pressures normally. So minus 33 deg degree uh, C ammonia, and we're putting it into a relatively warm residue tube. So imagine on a summer day, you've got a, a nice hot piece of glassware that you're putting this cold liquid into. What's gonna be happening to it? Well, it's gonna start bubbling away, of course, as you're trying to fill it up. And trying to fill a boiling liquid with a, with a, with a surface that's, that's jumping all over the place and trying to fill that up to a specific graduation mark on our, uh, you know, on the uh, residue tube can be very, very challenging. And of course, if you're, by the nature of this test, it's a volumetric test. So if you're off in your fill level, you're going to be off in the result of your, you know, of your sample or of your test proportionally. So as a result, it, it, it's gonna be really challenging. Uh, it's also difficult to control that rate of evaporation. Now, CGA methods, you know, I think the intention is that you would actually take it to a controlled environment and put it into a nice controlled warm bath of water and, and really have a nice uh, consistent evaporation method. In reality, what people tend to do is they take this residue tube out and they put it in the sun and let it evaporate in the heat of the sun. So not something that's really controlled in any way uh, you know, it does rely on the skill of the operator as well. Uh, you know, they have to be experienced with this. Um, but probably the biggest thing is the exposure. We talked about how toxic the ammonia can be. When people are taking the sample, they typically need to be gowned up in all sorts of PPE. 
you know, a, a full chemical suit in a lot of cases, gloves, respirator, goggles, uh, you know, so all of these things in order to protect that operator. And they typically have to evaporate, sorry, evacuate the area around where they're taking the sample as well. So as a result, you know, this, this sampling method, you know, it, it definitely has some challenges. Well, we were asked by one of our customers to actually work with them to develop a new process. Work with them to develop a process that was one, consistent with the CGA method, uh, so that we didn't have to convince the Department of Transportation who required this test uh, that, you know, that the effectiveness of a new testing method, but do this in a, such a way that it was safe for the operator and give us that nice consistency that we're looking for. So we developed a new fixture to be able to sample the liquid ammonia. I'll take a moment to describe the fixture here. So we've got an aluminum block that everything sits on top of, and then we've got two glass pipes. We've got an outer glass pipe, uh, which is a four inch diameter glass pipe, and we've got an inner glass pipe, which is a two inch diameter glass pipe. And that residue tube, that same residue tube that we used in the CGA uh, method, that actually fits down inside of that two inch glass pipe. Down at the bottom there, the, the, the purple, we've got a heat transfer fluid typically glycol or a propylene glycol, and that is used to draw heat in and out of the, the sample. So it's just a means of conveying the heat uh, to and from the sample uh, when we want to. Now the first thing we do, the first thing we do is we fill up the annulus between the two pipes with the liquid ammonia. And that does two things for us. One, it cools everything down. So it cools down that heat transfer fluid, which in turn cools down the residue tube. And two, it flushes out the sample line, the incoming sample line. So any old ammonia that was in that sample line, the, the line that runs from the tank to the sampler, has now been flushed out. We, we, we flush that out into this cold bath area. So we use that liquid ammonia, cooled everything down. Now we have a nice cold residue tube. We can go ahead then and fill our residue tube with liquid ammonia. Once we fill the res residue tube with liquid ammonia, we can turn on a heater. So we've got that aluminum heater block at the bottom. We turn that on, we drain away that cold bath. And as a result, our sample starts to evaporate because we're heating up our heat transfer fluid. And what we're gonna be left with is just a little bit of water down there at the bottom. And we have now take it out and read the, the, the water content that was in our sample. So we managed to do this basically take that entire CGA process and put it inside of a closed fixture. Now in this cartoon view, we show those valves up there at the top, but in reality, all of that is internally plumbed. So we don't have to worry about exposing, exposing the operator uh, to these, uh, these incoming streams of ammonia. It's all contained within the glass fixture itself, and it's glass so that you can actually see what's going on. So here's what the sampler actually looks like. We've got single or dual fixtures. So the fixture I just showed you, um, you can either have one or two of those. So you can, uh, some, a lot of customers like to have two so that they can, uh, so that they can take two samples at the same time and then compare them against each other and make sure that they match up. Uh, it does, you know, help with helping to control the way that the, that cold bath and the way that uh, residue tube are filled. And I'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, we've got, two main ways of controlling this. We've got a single hand wheel that, con that controls all of the valves we need to control within a certain process, as well as a PLC that's gonna take us through step by step. And of course, I mentioned the flammability of the ammonia. As a result, this is gonna be where it's at, whatever this is installed, this is gonna be a hazardous area. Uh, so of course we need to be, uh, you know, our, the equipment needs to be rated for that area. So it would be either class one, div two, group B or ATEX zone two, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, but the whole intent here is that we're trying to make this, this sampling operation safe, accurate, and precise. I'm gonna keep hammering on those points as we go through these next slides. That's really the intent and safety is probably number one. So starting off with safety, it all starts with that fixture, that enclosed fixture. We've got these glass pipes. Again, you can, here you can see the uh, you see those glass pipes pointed out. Uh, it's a four inch glass pipe with a two inch glass pipe inside of it with the residue tube sitting inside of that. 
This picture actually shows uh, dual fixtures. As I mentioned, it's available with either a single fixture or a dual fixture. Uh, and if you do need to get that residue tube out, which we, you will need to in order to get the uh, dispose of that little bit of water that's left over, you've got that four inch sanitary clamp connection to get the, the residue tube in and out of the fixture. So you don't need tools to get in and out. Now, we talked about changing phases and we want to eventually change phase. You know, that's the whole point of this test is to evaporate the ammonia and see what water is left behind. But we don't want to do it prematurely. We want to do it uh, only when we want to. So the key to doing that is to keeping everything cold and keeping everything pressurized until we want it to change phase. And so in order to cool things down, we've got a number of different approaches that we're taking. One is that we've got an ammonia fast loop going through the cabinet, going through the sampler. So we've got ammonia flowing through, keeping all the valves cold, uh, keeping everything nice and chilled. Uh, we've also got the cold bath that, for chilling that residue tube that I showed you in that cartoon animation. With that, again, we're using that ammonia that's sitting in that line, sitting in that transport line, and we're putting it to use. We're flushing it out and we're using that ammonia to cool everything down. So it goes into that cold bath, it bubbles away, cools everything down. And so now we've got a nice cold residue tube. We've also got uh, a, a few areas within the sampler where we're using the ammonia to pre-chill some of the transport lines inside the cabinet. And the way we do that is by having concentric lines. So in this example, in that line that's, that's supplying ammonia to that cold bath region, we're flowing that around the tube that supplies the ammonia to the residue tube. So now, as we flow this through, it's chilled down that, that ammonia that uh, ammonia supply line going to the residue tube. So when we flow that, that ammonia through there, it's not going through a warm tube that where it'll start flashing prematurely. It's going through a nice cold tube and it's not gonna start pre uh, flashing prematurely or at least going to minimize that. And again, it's really, uh, the intent here is to manage that phase change. We want it to happen, but we don't want it to happen prematurely. Talked about that cold bath. So here's actually a cutaway of the sample fixture. So you can see the, 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 the four inch glass pipe and the two inch glass pipe with the residue tube in the middle. The blue section there in the middle, that's that heat transfer fluid that, that I talked about. Uh, of course, in real life, you know, what propylene glycol is clear, uh, so you can see through it, but it's uh, blue in the, you know, just for the purpose of this example. We do have an RTD temperature sensor sticking up through the middle, so we can monitor the temperature of that, uh, uh, of that uh, heat transfer fluid as kind of a proxy for the, the sample temperature. And one of the things we wanted to do was to make sure that we were driving consistency uh, through the process and making sure that the fixture couldn't be overfilled. So the way we did that was by having an elevated drain tube. So when the operator goes to turn on the liquid ammonia to fill up that cold bath, once it reaches a certain level, which is the top of that drain tube, it just spills over and goes off to the drain. And we don't need to worry about the operator overfilling that, that fixture uh, and you know, potentially overflowing the, you know, the, the unit. So we're again, driving that precision, driving that safety. We also wanted to control the fill level of the residue tube as well. Now, again, filling the residue tube uh, up to that 100 milliliter line can definitely be challenging. And the traditional way to do that is to open a valve and allow it to flow in and then close the valve at exactly the right moment so that you have just the right amount of liquid. Uh, we decided that we wanted to make that a little bit more controlled, take some of that skill, you know, take some of that uh, out of the operator's hands, make it easier for them. Uh, so. We developed a cap fixture that goes on top of the residue tube that uses an overflow tube. And that overflow tube, when it's aligned to the 100 milliliter uh, graduation, will cause the ammonia to flow up and out of the overflow tube and into that cold bath region instead of filling up the, the residue tube the whole way. So as we fill that up, once it reaches the bottom of the overflow tube, it just goes off and goes into that cold bath region rather than filling up that top of the residue tube. It won't fill that up because there's gonna be gas that's trapped in the top there. And rather than compress that gas, the liquid is going to take the path of least resistance, which is the overflow tube. We can then turn on a purge gas and that purge gas will clean out those lines. It'll push that liquid level right down to that 100 milliliter graduation. And 
as, actually as our ammonia starts to evaporate, that purge will carry away the vapors and take them off to the vents or, or to the flare. So really what we end up with is a, uh, you know, is an operation that is really consistent because we're, we're filling those things consistently. Uh, we've got consistent fill levels. We've got consistent heating cycles. Uh, so we've got a, uh, we, we've really simplified the controls here. Uh, I mentioned that we have a single hand wheel that, that operates multiple valves at once. You can see the hand wheel there in the, the picture at the top. That hand wheel actually operates four different ball valves all at the same time. So rather than having the operator have to think through which valves get operated in which sequence, they simply have to turn that hand wheel to one of four different positions. And the PLC, the touchscreen, will tell them what position to, to turn that to. So they will get instruction on the PLC, uh, turn the hand wheel to the chill position, and then it'll tell them to wait until it cools down. Then it'll say, all right, turn to the sample position and wait, to, uh, wait until the uh, liquid overflows into the cold bath. And it just it goes through step by step like that, making it easy for the operator. So again, driving that precision, driving that accuracy, and that you know and that that simplified process really drives safety as well. So having uh, you know you know during the average cycle, the operator really only needs to interface with two different things: interface with the hand wheel and interface with the touch screen. So it's a, it's really a pretty simple process overall. So question then is how do things flow through the sampler. So let's take a quick look and see how things are, where is the ammonia going? Where's the, the nitrogen going? So we, when you walk up to the unit, you do have nitrogen flowing in. Uh, you do have that nitrogen flowing as a continuous purge into the control enclosure. Now I mentioned about the hazardous area classification uh, for this uh, sampler. Now in this case, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, hazardous area classifications are met by having some sort of a purge. Now with our sampler, that, that's actually not necessary. Uh, everything inside that control enclosure is rated for the hazardous environment, whether it be ATEX or the class one div two. Uh, but however, uh, ammonia and copper and, poly and uh, polycarbonate, uh, two components, sorry, two materials that are very prevalent in electronics, those things do not work well together. So if you get ammonia into that control enclosure for, in, whatever reason, uh, bad things are gonna happen. So we've got a continuous flow of nitrogen going into that, uh, into that enclosure just to keep the electronics nice and clean. I also mentioned an ammonia fast loop. With the ammonia fast loop flowing through the cabinet to keep everything nice and cold, you can see that uh, ammonia flowing from the supply to the return. First thing we do is we put the residue tubes into the fixture, so we load those in. Then we go to the uh, the chill position, and the chill will open up one of those four valves that you see there in the middle that are all ganged together with that hand wheel, and it allows the ammonia to flow up into the residue, or sorry, into the fixtures. And once they reach at the top of those drain tubes, they spill over and they go off to the drain, and the drain valve was also opened when we went to that chill position. So again, that single hand wheel is controlling multiple valves all at once. So just by switching to that chill position, we opened two valves, both the supply valve for the ammonia to fill that cold bath and also the drain valve. Next, we go to the sample position. Those, those two valves that we had already opened stay open, but now we've also opened the valve that allows the liquid ammonia to flow into the residue tube. And once that flows into the residue tube, it again will overflow into that cold bath region and just go off to drain. Next. Now that we've done that, we go to the purge position and that switches the three-way valve there on the left to allow all those lines to be purged out. And it also will open a valve to allow all the cold bath region to drain. So now we're ready to go ahead and turn on our heater. So we can do that. We turn on the heater and we start heating everything up. The sample starts to evaporate. As that ammonia evaporates, that purge carries away the vapors off to flare or off to, uh, off to you know, disposal of some sort. And then when we're done, we can go to the off position and take those things out and take our readings. So it's a really neat way of, again, minimizing the operator interaction. 
So they only really have to interact with that hand wheel and of course the touch screen that I mentioned that's giving them those on-screen instructions. Uh, but pretty simple operation overall uh, for us to be able to do that. Now to, to give you some, uh, you know, give some more details on this, you know, typically the, the sample time with the sampler is somewhere in the, the two hour range, uh, depending on the weather, depending on a few other factors, uh, about 10 minutes or so to capture the sample, plus the, the time to actually evaporate the sample, heat it up to that 120 degrees Fahrenheit and hold it there, et cetera. Um, we also, um, you know, we also do have, you know, a couple different versions of this in terms of the sample size. The CGA method specifically calls out a 100 milliliter version, uh, but there are others, other standards out there in the world that use a larger volume, a 250 milliliter uh, version. So, so we have that option available as well. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do was to make sure that we didn't have any leaks. So again, the whole point of this uh, was to minimize the operator exposure and to drive that consistency. So in the name of safety, we really wanted to drive down the number of leaks. And so as a result, we eliminated all the NPT connections inside the cabinet. You know, anything where we have, uh, you know, any connections that are, that are dealing with the ammonia, uh, they're either going to be welded, they're going to be tube fittings, or they're going to be, you know, an O-ring style SEE end connection. So as a result, you know, you have really high degree of leak integrity, guaranteed swage lock factor with the helium leak test even. So definitely something that we, we took very seriously um, with, uh, you know, with the leak integrity here. Maintenance, of course, is something that's going to be a concern as well. So we wanted to make this thing as easy as possible to maintain. So try to make it such that even though all these valves are geared together, you can still get there and access the valve packings to tighten those packings on a periodic basis. Their packed valves are going to need to be adjusted, so try to make it as easy as possible. And of course, you know, installation, operation, and maintenance manuals to be able to, uh, to you know, make recommendation on spares, uh, you know, maintenance frequency, that sort of thing. So uh, definitely some some things that we've got going on there. And. You know, this is a part number structure. I won't go through it with you, but there's a lot of different selections. You know, we talked about the, the number of samplers, the number of samples, the sample size, and different pressure units, temperature units, different options, voltages, hazardous area requirements, et cetera. Uh, but overall, a lot of different options to really be able to customize this for uh, your specific need in your specific region. And then, you know, just to sum up, you know, the, the, this, you know, this ammonia sampler, it's really all about the safety of the operator, uh, more so than the other two, the, the safety, precision, and accuracy. And those are the three things I said I was going to harp on. Uh, safety is by far the, the number one, but precision and accuracy uh, come as a nice bonus uh, with this sampler. You know, by, by making that process a bit more automated, we take out a lot of the variables. That drives consistency, that drives accuracy. And by enclosing it all in enclosed fixtures, that's what, in isolating that operator, that's what drives the safety, minimizes any sort of exposure they may have. Now, you can learn more uh, about this. Of course, you can uh, you can join SwageLock on, on social media. Uh, we've got uh, presence on all the, the usual places, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Uh, you can also join our, you know, see us on our, our website, swagelock.com, or we've got a nice blog, Swagelock Reference Point, on a number of different topics. And you can also expect to hear from the PI Process in Instrumentation uh, you know, with you know, the link. Uh, so expect to see that email coming through. And at this point, I think we're going to go ahead and open it up for any questions that you guys might have. All right. Thank you, Matt. That was a great presentation. And, and as you mentioned, we're now going to start the question and answer portion of the webcast. Uh, as a reminder to the audience, in order to submit a question, simply type into the Q&A window of your screen and then hit the submit button. Any questions we do not get to during the live event will be answered after the conclusion of today's webcast. Looks like we have a few questions in the queue that have already been submitted, so we'll get started right away. Uh, our first question for Matt asks, can ammonia be burned as a fuel? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we, we talked about how it can be used as a hydrogen carrier and with, you know, with the idea of hydrogen being a fuel, but rather than converting it back to hydrogen, can we use the ammonia directly? Uh, and the answer is yes, yes we can. Uh, there are, uh, 
engines that can that can burn the ammonia. So, for example, the ships that would transport the liquid ammonia will very often uh, use the ammonia itself a, as a fuel. Uh, it could potentially be used in you know, some uh, heavy duty transport. So think trains, buses, perhaps, uh, but it's not something you would ever expect to use in a commercial type of vehicle though, or rather consumer type of vehicle, uh, just because it's, uh, you know, because of the toxicity. Uh, there are other considerations as well. You know, when you burn ammonia, you end up with NOx and, and some other pollutants that you, that you generally don't want. Uh, so burning or not necessarily burning, we could burn the hydrogen, but uh, using it, converting it back to hydrogen and then using a fuel cell for the hydrogen is generally gonna be a cleaner way of doing it, but burning the ammonia directly uh, is definitely a possibility. Uh, there is also the possibility of using uh, ammonia fuel cells. That's a relatively new technology that people are working on uh, to actually use a fuel cell to convert the ammonia into electricity, which could then be used to power uh, transportation or whatever. Okay, thank you, Matt, for that answer. Our next question asks, does this sampler also test the ammonia for oil content? Okay, uh, yeah, uh, the, the answer to that is no. Uh, so a little bit of background for those who don't know, uh, there are generally two primary measurements that ammonia producers are worried about. One is the moisture, and the second one is the, uh, the oil content that would typically come from the compressors uh, in, the, in the process. Uh, with that, uh, you know, some of the oil might leak past the seals and get into the ammonia itself. And so we need to test that, uh, that ammonia to see how much oil content we have. Uh, this unit does not do that. Uh, it does uh, just the, the, the moisture content measurement. However, that residual moisture that's still in the bottom of that residue tube, that little bit of water, that can be subsequently tested to get that oil measurement. So that could be then taken back to the laboratory where it could be reconstituted with you know, like a hexane or, or, or something like that, uh, and then analyzed for the oil content or potentially even heavy metals. So that's a, a, a possibility. Okay, thank you. Our next question asks, does the operator have to wait by the sampler while the ammonia sample evaporates? Uh, no, no, that they do not. Uh, that would be an awful waste of somebody's time <laughs> uh, to sit there and, and watch uh, watch ammonia boil away. Uh, so the, the the sampler, as I mentioned, typically takes about two hours, and we, there are some relay outputs that it has. That so you can monitor that remotely. Once it's uh, once it's done, it will give a remote signal uh, to to let let whoever know that it's time to come back and take the reading. Okay, it looks like we have another question uh, in the queue and it asks how much N2 is used in the enclosure, enclosure purge in, I believe it's liters per minute, but you can correct, correct. me if yeah. I'm wrong there. Yep, uh, lo looks like liters per minute. Yeah, the, that purge is set to three liters per minute through the, uh, through the enclosure purge, which I believe gives us a turnover uh, every few minutes uh, a turnover of the air inside of that enclosure. So three liters per minute, the continuous flow of, of purge. Okay, it looks like we have one more question uh, that asks, if I have a system running up to 150 PSIG, is there a reason to select the 160 PSIG, PSIG version versus one of the higher pressure versions? Um, no, I, I I, there's no real, uh, I, I would say that we'd, you'd probably select one at a slightly higher pressure version. And the reason I say that is uh, you typically want to end up in the middle, um, you know, the middle range, in the middle of your gauge range. So you might t select a slightly higher pressure unit so that you end up in the middle of that range. But 150 PSI is definitely, in, you know, definitely a possibility for, uh, you know, for this sampler. Okay. Thank you, Matt. It looks like uh, the last question that was submitted today, so that will conclude the question and answer portion of today's webcast. Uh, before we conclude today's presentation, I'd like to once again thank our sponsor, SwageLock, and on behalf of PI Process Instrumentation, have a productive remainder of the day.